Together, we are going to preview inductive logic. We're going to consider such inductions as universal generalization, inductive analogy, analogy syllogism, statistical generalization, statistical syllogism. We will at least briefly touch upon testimony or arguments from authority. In addition, we will briefly consider causal inference, which includes efficient, final, formal, and material causality. And finally, we will take a brief look at predictive reasoning, which includes classical probability, frequentist probability, and Bayesian probability. Hi, I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. At my website, you will find an extensive tutorial on traditional verbal style logic. I have a few entries on induction, and I cover many of the topics in this video. Now, Bertram Russell once humorously said, there are two kinds of logic, deductive and bad. So I guess we're going to preview bad logic here. But in any case, what is induction? Now, sometimes an older textbook will only define induction as an argument that moves from more particular propositions to more general universal propositions, and that's it. So based on this definition, an argument from authority or testimony is not an inductive argument, period. In contrast, more modern textbooks will define induction more broadly to be basically any probabilistic argument, so to speak, that lacks deductive certainty. And in this sense, based on this modern definition, an argument from authority is definitely an inductive argument. So we're going to preview all of this, or at least give a sample of many different features of induction, which I haven't covered too much on my YouTube channel yet. But we'll start from the beginning, so to speak, and the most important place to start is universal generalization and contrast that with inductive analogy, which is not the same thing. Now, universal generalization makes an inference to the effect that all members of a perceived group have a particular attribute. We have the group S, and each of those members, the first member, the second member, the third member, all the way to the nth member, have attribute P. And so we make a conclusion that therefore, where those three dots mean therefore, all S has attribute P. Is that a good argument? Well, it depends. So we're making a conclusion about a population based on a sample. We don't see all of S. We're generalizing. But since the sample is only a fraction of the population, these samples must be representative of the population as a whole. The only way to make a leap from a sample to a population is if the sample mirrors it. That's key. We want something unbiased. We want something representative. And in statistics, for example, that usually means the sample is random. It's going to be random, although there are different types of sampling techniques. Statisticians emphasize the importance of randomness. There is no pattern. Every member must be equally likely to be selected. If that doesn't happen, we're going to distort our understanding of the population. Clearly, other things being equal, a larger sample size is better than a smaller one. But more importantly, again, it must be representative of the group in question. It shouldn't be biased in favor or against any possible subgroup of the group. A sample that is more varied, therefore, is better. It might be that all swans so far have been white. Ergo, it seems probable to conclude that all swans are white. The conclusion, as a universal generalization, is not merely that the next swan will be white. It rather infers that all swans in the world are white, period. Swan number one is white. Number two is white. Swan number n is white, ergo all swans are white. But this famous example shows the fallibility of, of induction. It was perhaps a reasonable argument until, that is, a black swan was discovered in Australia. Once we insert that premise into our data set that swan n is black, or n plus 1 is black, we can no longer conclude that all swans are white. Now, an inductive analogy is different. It makes a predictive inference about the next instance of something. Therefore, it is a less broad conclusion than a universal generalization. S sub 1 has attribute P, S sub 2 has attribute P, S sub 3 has attribute P, and so on and so forth down to number N, S sub N has attribute P. Therefore, the next S observed will have the attribute of P, so S sub N plus 1. It's not a universal sweeping statement about all S, it's just saying the next S will have attribute P. That's an inductive analogy, which is different than a universal generalization. The next thing to consider is an analogy syllogism. S has attributes P sub 1 to P sub N. So it has the attribute P sub 1, P sub 2, P sub 3, and so on to P sub N. 
T likewise has attributes P sub 1 to P sub N. U has attributes P sub 1 to P sub N minus 1. So because it has all the attributes from 1 to N minus 1, therefore it seems likely that U has attribute P sub N as well. Note there's always a comparison between two or more things in an analogy. A similarity is found. It's not a matter of simply counting similarities. It's more importantly a matter of finding relevant similarities so as to be able to draw the conclusion. Relevancy is key. That's paramount, ultimately. You might find a lot of similar attributes, maybe a ton of them, but they might have no importance or relevancy. And that's a judgment call. Moreover, other things being equal, the argument becomes stronger if the similarity is among multiple entities. Hence, if entities S and T have attributes 1 to N, entity U has attributes 1 to N minus 1, then it is more likely than otherwise that U has attribute N. But again, relevancy is key. Relevancy. Not just the number of attributes, but relevancy. Are the attributes relevant? Such that we can make this analogy. And then we have statistics which is a huge topic in and of itself, obviously, and I'm no expert. But there's some basic things we can state here and understand here for sure. And that includes statistical generalization and also statistical syllogism. When we're making an inference about all members of a population based on a sample, we have a statistical generalization. For example, since 98% of the widgets sampled in the factory work, it likely follows that about 98% of all the widgets in the factory work. Again, that sample better be good. So X percentage of observed S has observed P, therefore about X percentage of all S has attribute P. Now in a statistical syllogism, we derive a conclusion about a particular member of a population. For example, since 98% of widgets in the factory work, this particular widget will likely work. The major premise was discovered through statistical techniques. So, greater than 50% of S has attribute P, T is an S, therefore T likely has attribute P. 98%, by the way, in our examples, obviously greater than 50%, ergo, is a good major premise in a statistical syllogism. But with that said, there's no generally agreed to formulation of these arguments. For instance, another formal way to present the statistical syllogism is as follows. We can say X percentage of S is P, T is an S, ergo, it's X percentage probable that T is P. Notice that we're probable. According to the frequentist interpretation of probability, which we'll get down to when we talk a little bit about Richard von Mises, the probability will match relative frequencies. So if we pick something at random, what is chosen in the long run will tend to match the relative frequencies of the underlying data, so to speak. So statistics is definitely a part of good induction. And it's a subject we also know at least the basic fundamentals of. And it's actually a really interesting topic when you get down to it. But jumping into another area altogether in a way, um, when it comes to induction, we have testimony or authority. Now, we all rely on testimony and authority. Most of what we know is through testimony and authority when you get down to it. We consult experts all the time. We have a division of labor with their specialization. None of us can be an expert on everything. So I rely on the authority of, you know, the car mechanic to tell me what's wrong with my car. I'm not an expert on automobiles and so on and so forth. But if we're going to make arguments based on testimony or authority, we better make sure there's relevant expertise. I don't go to my dentist to talk about cars. We should also think about the trustworthiness of the person or group in question. So in general, expertise must be had by an identifiable person or group. This expertise must be relevant and reliable. And there should be an objectivity or disinterestedness. Another area of induction deals with causal inference. And despite the skepticism of a David Hume, common sense suggested, hey, there are cause and effect relationships. We act in a world in which they seem to exist. Okay, the engineer can build a skyscraper because there are cause and effect relationships. We make causal inferences all the time. But it's not just narrowed down to efficient causality. That's the most common type of causality we talk about. This is a causality which deals with something bringing about something else or changing something else. We could ask the question, who or what made this, for example. The final cause deals with the end or tendency of something. Why was this made or done? What's the natural tendency 
of this thing? Is there a finality to it such that it has a certain tendency to, to do this or do that? And in fact, efficient and final causality go together. If A brings about B, A is the efficient cause of B. But B is the final cause of A because that efficient cause A has a tendency to produce B. So B is the final cause. Efficient and final go together. Those are known as extrinsic causes. But you can also talk about formal and material causes, which are intrinsic. The formal cause deals with what something is. What is it? The material cause deals with what something is made of, or its composition, so to speak. It's the raw materials which are determined by the form to be a certain kind of thing. So causal inference is another component to thinking about induction. And finally, there's predictive reasoning. And here we jump into probability theory. And this is a huge topic, of course. But we can think about classical probability, which is a priori probability. Probability we can just reason in our armchair, so to speak. But there's also something known as frequentist probability, which is a posteriori, which is empirical, empirically based, that is. And there's Bayesian probability as well, which, roughly speaking, can include beliefs and our confidence in something. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. But probability can also be thought in terms of an objective sense and a subjective sense. That is to say, what are the objective tendencies of things out there in the world we measure them and calculate them? Or we can think about our beliefs. So in that sense, we can think about subjective probability. But in any case, the probability of a future event is the ratio of occurrences or frequencies of a particular event to the total number of possible events. That's what we learn in high school math when we're dealing with probability theory. Now, probability is based on three central axioms. And here we can think about this in an armchair way. And they go back to Kolgomorov's axioms. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name. But the first axiom is that for all p, that is to say the probability of p, is going to be between 0 and 1. The second axiom is that if p is certain, then the probability of p is 1. In other words, 100%. And the third axiom is if p and q are incompatible, then the probability of p or q is the probability of p plus the probability of q. And that's really common sense. So, for example, if I'm thinking about the probability of me going to McDonald's or Burger King, I could do one or the other. Well, it's the probability of going to Burger King plus the probability of going to McDonald's, right? So there's a common sense um, to these axioms, which we can build off of. And we can think about probability, again, in an objective sense or a subjective sense. We can think about classical probability in the a priori sense or in an empirical sense, the frequentist probability of, for example, Richard von Mises, who was the brother of the economist Ludwig von Mises. Now, interestingly enough, um, the brothers disagreed on methodology, but they did agree on probability. So here, probabilities are in reference to properly defined collectives. We learned about the collective and individual cases are known as just being members of the collective. And this influences, for example, how we should view insurance or risk in economic theory. It certainly influenced um, Ludwig von Mises. And then we have Bayesian probability. Again, we can only just skim this right now. And this can be used both for subjective and objective probability, and we can use it to, so to speak, update a probability hypothesis with new data. I don't know why I say we new data. It's supposed to be with new data. Say with, okay, with new data. We can think of it in terms of the probability A exists because B caused it, or the probability of B given evidence A. And there's this famous formula. The interesting thing about this is that many philosophers have used this type of reasoning to think about and consider different types of theories and to say which theory is more plausible or probable. Now, I am the amateur logician, as I said, from amateurlogician.com. Um, I'm sorry if I haven't been producing as many videos as before. Um, I've just been busy, and I also have a cold uh, right now. I'm a little bit sick under the weather. But regardless, I very much appreciate your viewership, and I hope these types of videos are interesting and useful to you, especially if you're just beginning this stuff and want to learn more about logic. Induction is very important. Um, deduction is also important, but look, much of our reasoning is going to be inductive, not deductive when you get down to it. So you really have to think about induction and studying it, not just studying deduction and the categorical syllogisms or propositional logic or whatnot. Um, there's a lot to explore just in induction alone. 
Thanks for watching this video. Good luck to you and be well.